Great. So hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Kristen, and I've been with Plexon for about a year and a half now. I came from a postdoc where I used fiber, fiber photometry to study the effects of adolescent alcohol exposure on extinction learning. So in my postdoc, I wrote my own MATLAB analysis code. Now, I love MATLAB, but not everybody else does. And in addition, fiber photometry currently doesn't really have a gold standard uh, for analysis procedures. So today I'm going to be talking about two resources, uh, PMAT and Guppy, that are working towards creating the standard fiber photometry analysis. So at this point, some of you who are newer to fiber photometry might be thinking, why does, why does this analysis need MATLAB or these specialized analysis programs? Aren't the data just displayed as delta F over F, um, which is change in fluorescence over fluorescence? which is shown in this graph here over time. Well, unfortunately, while the concept is simple, the mathematical execution is not. And this is because the isobestic control, which is used as the baseline because it's a calcium independent signal, is on a different scale and a different range than the signal of interest. So you can see this in the raw data I have displayed here. Um, here's a 470 uh, G-CAMP signal and a 410 isobestic control signal. Uh, these data are from the Speschke and colleagues paper, um, which I find really useful for understanding some of these mathematics. So I'm gonna be going through the three steps that are done so that the 470 signal and the 410 signal can be directly compared in a delta F over F. So I wanna do this so that you have a better idea of what both Pima and Guppy are doing to the data and why these resources are so useful. So the first step is a baseline correction to correct any downward trend in the mean over time due to quenching. Uh, the next step is to standardize the Y scale. This is very similar to a Z score. And sorry, I missed the slide where you had uh, packages out of like the references. Just go back. Um, that's actually going to be in my presentation several times, and um, I've also posted in the chat a PDF version of this presentation, um, so you guys can, somebody there can download it, um, which will have all the references and things in it. And then you can also email me directly if you want it. I'll give it out. All right, so um, we were, we went the baseline correction step, there was standardization, and then the final step is a linear regression, um, which fits the 410 isobestic signal with the 470 G-CAMP signal or signal of interest, and then signals can be aligned on the same axis. And then and only then can the delta F over F uh, signal be done using the fitted G-CAMP and isobestic control signals. So that was really fast and that's a lot, but the good news is that PMAT and Guppy handle all that math for you. Um, and so while it's important to understand, um, it's not something that you actually have to know how to do by hand. Another thing to note is that because there's no gold standard in fiber photometry analysis, there are no two labs that use the exact same calculations. And we'll see this a little bit when we're comparing the data output from PMAT and Guppy. Now, speaking of the data, um, before we can use these tools, we need to actually know what data we're going to be using. So the data today are from a proof of concept experiment. There was a mouse that was expressing a fluorescent uh, D light signal, which is a dopamine indicator. The mouse was free to roam in a home cage and periodically an air puff was delivered to the face to elicit a neuronal signal. The air puff was uh, timed using a keyboard TTL event. So this is important to note just because um, this means the TTL event actually lags when the air puff was delivered. Uh, so all the data were collected using a Plexon multi-wavelength fiber photometry system. So let's talk a little bit more about what these data are. So Plexon's fiber photometry system has three excitation wavelengths, 465 nanometers for green fluorescence, 410 for isobestic control and 560 for red fluorescence. Um, this is a camera-based system, which means it's easy to select multiple 
fiber regions of interest. Plexon offers um, patch cables that you can do up to four fibers at a time. The data are collected at 30 Hertz and this is synchronized with the integrated behavioral video and tracking software so that you can track behavior and your fibers at the same time. In addition, you can link this system with outside sources so you can track tones, lights, or in today's case, AirPods. So putting this all together, that's actually a lot of data, which is another reason why PMAT and Guppy are so useful is they make these large data sets um, more manageable to analyze. So from Plexon system, these data are exported into CSV files. Everyone's probably familiar with this file format. It's an um, open source file format that um, is commonly used with Excel. So these are the data um, raw from Plexon system. However, both PMAT and Guppy require their own specific layouts of these files. I'm not gonna go into the nitty gritty details of this reformatting in this presentation, um, but if you want to see this, there will be videos on Plexon's website. So now that I've gone over why we need these analyses, what they help us to do, and the data we're going to be looking at, um, I want to show you a little bit of a hands-on tutorial using both PMAT and Guppy. Um, so both have really great help sources published on the uh, GitHub page for the labs. Um, these GitHub pages are also cited in the papers themselves. Um, everything I talk about today in reference to PMAT and Guppy, including um, instructional videos and a comparison blog, uh, will be posted on Plexon's website over the next couple of days. So if you're interested, um, you can sign up for our newsletters. So first, um, I want to look at PMAT from the David Barker Lab at Rutgers. All right, so I already have PMAT loaded here. Um, let's see. So PMAT is written in MATLAB. However, you do not need MATLAB to run PMAT. Here I'm showing actually the independent application which runs um, without a MATLAB license. So both team, uh, excuse me, both PMAT and Guppy um, were first developed for TDT data. So that file format is very easy to use in both programs. Um, and there's a couple holdovers, which, which I'll point out that are specific to TDT data. Um, PMAT is very easy to use. Each of these sections and boxes can be run by themselves. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on the plot trace data, which is uh, the Delta F over F over time for the entire session and a peri event histogram around those air puffs. So to load our data, it's a little tiny import button up here in the left hand corner. Um, it's gonna ask us where the data are. Um, I find it most useful to keep the data on my user folder, just on the hard drive themselves. And then I have um, specifically formatted files and it's asking specifically first for our, fiber, for our fiber photometry data, the fluorescent data. It's gonna open a little screen here that's gonna ask me how many time points I want to eliminate before the start of the file. So this is one of those holdovers from TDT data, which typically has a very sharp increase um, in the fluorescence as it starts recording. However, it's really beneficial to have because the particular file I'm talking about today, the recording was started before the LEDs were turned on. So I need to actually eliminate the first um, 1,713 samples, which is about 58 seconds and then nothing from the end of the file. Immediately, it's gonna ask us to open our behavioral or TTL event file. And then you can see it loads. You're now allowed to click on things and you see um, the labeled event. So let's start just, um, I wanna show you a normalized Delta F over F graph. So this was all those steps, the Delta F over F was calculated and then it was further normalized with the Z-score. I want to plot my air puff event so I can see where it was in time and then plot it. So take a second, here we go. Now our Delta F over F over time with our air puff is plotted. So it also came up with this um, little warning or little notification that the graph was saved. So PMAT will save every figure that it creates. 
And very nicely, it'll save back into our data folder. So here's where our, our photometry and behavioral data was. This is where we said it was. And then it opens a little figure, creates a figures folder. And now we can see there are two versions, a JPEG and a MATLAB figure. So if you are a MATLAB wizard, you can actually go back into this MATLAB folder and extract the data if you then want to do further analysis or group analyses. Now let's look at a, very, um, a peri event time histogram. So we're just gonna do our air puff again, the only one I have here. I just wanna look at negative one second to two seconds around that air puff. Um, I wanna have a baseline sampling window from negative one to zero, which is a window duration of one second. Now this bin constant is another TDT specific thing. So TDT data is collected at a little over a thousand Hertz. And so this bin constant is saying, we're going to average a hundred of those points into one. So you're binning the data, make it a little bit more manageable to analyze. Now this doesn't make a lot of sense with the 30 Hertz collection rate of a Plexon system. So I'm actually gonna use a bin constant of one, meaning I wanna use every single data point. Say so I wanna do a Z-score pair event histogram. I wanna uh, do the graph. I'm actually gonna to choose to export a couple uh, different uh, data traces, which we'll, we'll export as CSV files. Okay, so then here is our graph that it shows up with. We have a nice average line graph on the bottom and then a heat map of all our trials. So now, I don't know about you, but the first thing that I see when I look at this heat map is, oh my gosh, there's absolutely no color bar. What the heck is the scale on this thing? So you can actually click it. It doesn't look like it's selected, but you can click the heat map and then insert a color bar. And then further, you can click, right click on the color bar and then choose a different um, color map if you like. So now I do wanna quickly show you what it would look like if that bin constant was five. So that is we're taking five points and binning them into one. So here you can see, let me pull up that other one real quick. Here you can see that it's not quite as smooth and that makes sense because we're looking at a different or fewer data points. Another thing that's nice about PMAT is it will never save over a figure. So here you can see it has two different uh, Z-score pair event histograms uh, because we made two different graphs. And the data that we export to CSV files, we can also see that we have now two different files in their own little data folder. So it's easy to keep track of all your data. So in summary, I find PMAT very easy to use. Um, it's very easy to take raw data and turn it into a meaningful graph very quickly. However, if you need to do a more complex analysis with multiple animals over multiple days and in multiple groups, then you can use Guppy to great advantage. So let's talk about Guppy from the Cynthia Lerner Lab at Northwestern. So to start off with, Guppy is actually a little bit more intimidating because it runs on um, a Python background. It was programmed in Python or Anaconda. So you have to use a command window when you're installing it and every time you open it. However, the, the GitHub page from the Learner Lab is excellent. They document it extremely well how to use this program. So here I already have it loaded. It opens a graphical user interface. Um, well, you can then enter all your parameters. So we're just gonna do an individual analysis, um, but here is the group analysis that you can also do. So here I already have my Guppy uh, folder selected. So what's really nice is you can move over the entire folder instead of the individual data files. This again, makes it really easy to do a lot very fast. However, one of the downsides about Guppy to me is that you have to fill out all of these parameters before you can do anything. Um, so that is the general parameters over here. So let's start with those. So do I wanna combine data? This is, this is if you have uh, multiple animals in a group, I don't. I do have an isobestic control. Guppy has um, an analysis where if you don't have an isobestic control, it can calculate a proxy for you. So I want to eliminate the first 58 seconds from my file. And again, that um, holdover from TBT. 
And this is actually rounding versus exact number of points in PMAP. This uh, window for a moving average filter. Um, Guppy says that for slower collected data, this should be between five and 10, whereas for TDT, it should be 100. Now for the different uh, graphs here, I have to choose what I want to see, z-score, difference, or both. Um, I'll see a z-score for my paravent histogram. I'll see a z-score for my transients. So the transients are um, more of a, a peak analysis that it does. And then the actual delta f over f plot, I also want to see z-score because that um, was what I graphed in PMAT. And I want to show you a comparison. Uh, this moving window for transients, now this is comparable to the bin constant that we did in PMAT. So I'm going to put that at one. And then I don't have any artifacts to remove, but Guppy has this really nice feature so that if, say, your uh, feral became disconnected from your animal at some point in the recording, you need to remove that section. Um, otherwise, it's going to throw off the calculations. OK, so then I have to fill out all the z-score parameters. I'm just doing a, a standard z-score, the peri-event histogram parameters. So to compare it to the PMAT data, negative one to two seconds. Uh, this time interval is interesting. It's so that you don't have overlapping um, histograms. So it says, essentially, if you have two TTL pulses, two behavioral events that are you know, within this time interval, it won't do the second one. So I just want to put that at zero so that I look at all of my instances. And then here's another binning fact. Um, another binning uh, measurement. My baseline parameters, I want to do negative one to zero. And then I do have to set actually uh, this parameter. So this is area under the curve. I'm not really interested in talking about that today. Um, it's not the most common analysis um, that I've seen and I didn't do it in PMAT. So I just set everything to zero. Otherwise it will give you errors. Now, I have data selected, everything is set. Now let's actually start doing the analysis, which is um, all over here on the left, you have to do it step by step. So you have to save these parameters and you'll notice, um, maybe you notice the anaconda prompt um, had a couple more lines added. So if you're gonna get an error, it's gonna be in the anaconda, anaconda prompt, it's not gonna pop up in the GUI or graphical user interface. Uh, the next step is to open store names. So store names are a huge tripping block for me, for others on the GitHub page. There's lots of questions about it. And that's because they have to be formatted so specifically. But essentially what they're doing is saying this file is signal data um, for this region or this fiber or um, this wavelength, if you're doing more than one wavelength. And so you're essentially telling Guppy, which, which file corresponds to what data? Because it doesn't know what your file names mean. So I've actually already done these files on this computer. So it actually remembered the store names that I use. So easily I can select those and then move, move on quickly. But again, if you want to know some of the errors I ran into here, <clears throat> those videos that we're going to be posting on um, the Puxon website over the next couple of weeks talks more about that. Over here in the prompt, the Anaconda prompt, we can see that there were um, some more lines added, no errors, we're good to go. So we go back to the original GUI. <clears throat> Excuse me. So then the next step is to read the raw data. Raw data was imported. Now we extract timestamps. So now we have some graphs to look at. So unlike PMAT, Guppy does not automatically save these. You have to manually save them. And then this is the uh, delta F over F normalized over time. So let me bring up the same graph from PMAT. So unfortunately, there's really no way to modify the, the y-axis on either of these graphs. So you kind of have to eyeball it. But this first tall peak in both of these graphs occurs at around five. So have, has about a height of five. So that's approximately equal between the two. But then the other peaks look to be a little bit 
greater in guppy than in pima so this is a small difference but it is something that is brought about by these different calculations slightly different binning procedures you know how many points we had to um, chop off from the beginning of the file things like that so in Guppy, you do have to close the figures before you can move on. I'm just going to save it and move on. So that was timestamps. Then we can do the pair event histogram computation. It'll take a second. It'll pop up with another graph. And this is that transients graph. Um, I'm not interested in saving this, so I will just close that. And then finally, we can open a visualization user user interface. So this is really nice if you have a lot of figure, or excuse me, a lot of animals, a lot of different behavioral events to look at. You can look at them one by one together. Since I only have one animal and one event, um, these are the average line graphs for the pair event histogram. Um, this is individuals. This is mean but you can kind of change the y axis so that, it, or excuse me, the x axis. So it makes more sense. You can change the y axis a little bit. You can change how they're saved. You can change their, the size of the graph. You can change basically anything but the color. And then um, you can save them. Over on the other tab, here's our heat map. So again, you can change the size. You can change the color map. Um, ooh, that one's terrible. Um, you can change actually which timestamps or which uh, trial numbers are in your heat map. And again, you can save it. So I've been hitting save, but where are these files saving? Good question. So again, that is, we told it where our, our um, data files were. So it's gonna save right back into that same folder. Here is the formatted output. So we have a folder called saved plot. That's where all those heat maps, um, well, should have saved. I guess I didn't save, um, would be saved in there. And then unbeknownst to us, we didn't tell it to do this, but Guppy actually saves quite a few of the data files as it's going through and doing these calculations. Let me try to save that. No, okay, it's not saving today. Um, so that's kind of Guppy in a nutshell. Um, it's very, very powerful if you have a, a lot of animals, sessions, groups, but there is a bit of a learning curve. Um, so if you need to look at your data quickly and you're just starting out, maybe start with PMAT and then move to Guppy. So I have just a few uh, parting comments. So let me switch back to my PowerPoint. Okay, so here are two more data analysis resources that I think explain the calculations pretty well. So if you want to learn more about them. And if you have any specific questions, if you didn't get a chance to look at the PDF, the PowerPoint, if you want it, um, you can email me directly at kristen at plexon.com, very easy. Or if you want more general information about the photometry system, about the newsletter, things like that, you can, you can email info at plexon.com.